Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger, and we are talking today about Nebuchadnezzar. We are chronologically in the Babylonian exile. Um, we've been talking about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Hananiah, Mishael, and I always forget the last one. Azariah. Azariah. As soon as I say that I've forgotten it, I remember. Oh, sorry. Isn't that the way? Yeah. Mm. No, for with me, it's not. I forget. And I really <laughs> don't remember. I start asking my class, what is the word I am looking for? <laughs> anyway, moving on. Anyhow, we've been hopping back and forth between Daniel and Ezekiel, um, as far as a text goes. And we are coming today to Daniel chapter four and uh Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a tree, first of all. Yeah, we were talking up front as to why we're why we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar. And I, with a degree of smart allocacy, said, because that's what's next. <laughs> and then, well, God thought it was important. But I I, I want to point something out that I, I haven't mentioned yet, and don't I generally forget to mention. You realize that. In the first four chapters of Daniel, there is only one person who appears in each, and it's not Daniel. Hmm. It's Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is actually the character, to use literary terms, he's the dynamic character. Hmm. He's the one who changes the most. The, the young men, yes, they come of age, they mature in their face, they take a stand. Nebuchadnezzar goes from blatant pagan conqueror antichrist to a godly man whom God uses to write scripture. In fact, he is, and until we get to Dr. Luke in the, in the Gospels, he is the only Gentile who gets to write an entire chapter of scripture. And he wrote it probably in his own thinking, not as scripture as such, but he wrote it as a letter to the world, his world, which was quite large at the time, to tell them about his conversion. So it's also one of those rare things in Scripture, a conversion story mm -hmm. uh, from a king who uses... Talk about politically incorrect. Here is a civil ruler using the channels of civil authority to tell people that he's been converted to worship the God of Israel, the God of heaven, and that they should take note and consider doing... But likewise, boy, he would get flack today if he were an American <laughs> president trying to do this. And yeah. unfortunately, the flack would not be simply from the secular media. There would be a lot mm -hmm. of Christians who would say, well, that's mixing church and state. There are still Christian scholars and Christian denominations who haven't forgiven Constantine for ending persecution of Christians. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and that's the funny thing that people come after Nebuchadnezzar for, or after the scriptural account, they say that this... Uh, conversion is not witnessed by any other document. And so they say, oh, well, this is clearly false because there's no other evidence that Nebuchadnezzar converted to Yahweh worship. Well, <laughs> of course, nobody else would write it down because yeah. that means they lost, you know? Yeah, it wouldn't yeah. be in any other religion's interest to document the most powerful king in the world converting to the religion of Yahweh. We have enough trouble trying to document the Christian convictions of our own presidents. <laughs> there is still real debate as to whether Washington and Lincoln were Christians. I, I'm, and honestly, I favor Lincoln over Washington because he, Lincoln had pastors whose churches he attended who said, of course, he's a Christian. Washington is a little more difficult. Uh, he kept his religion very private, never spoke about it in public, except in the broadest and most generic, you know, nature and nature's God kind of stuff. So, yeah, in America, we have this marvelous tradition where every presidential candidate and, and, and um, elected official has to make mention of God and probably make mention of the Bible. He may not do any more than that, however. Mm -hmm. He may not use the name of Jesus. He may not speak of the Trinity. He may not speak of the law of God. He can only speak vaguely because we expect that, but when we come to afterwards and try to track down his Christian faith, we have those dear Christian souls who say, he mentioned God. See, he's obviously a Christian. Don't you understand how politics and propaganda work? 
And, and then there are others who say, well, yeah, he mentioned God, but everybody did, so that's no evidence. Well, in itself, no. Uh, but he went to church. Yeah, but that was probably window dressing. Uh, what do you want exactly? I am reminded for other reasons of um, Shakespeare. Was he really a Christian? Okay, what do you want? His writings <laughs> yeah. reflect a Christian worldview. He was a member of the Anglican Church. Not only they not only reflect a Christian worldview, they talk about forgiveness and the blood of mm -hmm. Christ. Not not as a major theme because he's doing tragedies mostly. And he's not writing gospel tracts, and yet the understanding is clear. He does not attack it. He uses it and supports it, and he was a member of a church, and we know nothing otherwise against his character, except he was an actor. You know, if you want to believe that no actor can be saved, well, there you go. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it, this is interesting in that Nebuchadnezzar comes right out and says, look, I worship the God of heaven, and he's a very specific God. He's not a God in general. He's not my. He's not the gods I used to worship. He is the god of Daniel, however. So, with that in mind, let's find out about this um, this proclamation he makes, this letter he writes, and um, just talk about some things in it as we go along. So, this is chapter four of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. Now, of course, his kingdom was not worldwide, but in terms of the world they knew, it covered a lot of territory. Not as big as actually Persia or Greece or Rome, but still plenty big. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs! And how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Here is a God who rules in the earth and is able to do signs and wonders, things that defy naturalistic explanation. Now he's going to tell us about what exactly in the world he experienced. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. Things were going fine. I'd conquered the world. Was sitting back and relaxing. He was also, he wanted to re be remembered more as a architect and builder than as a conqueror. Brilliant general, secular historians tell us, up there along the lines of Napoleon and um, Alexander. But he rebuilt Babylon. He built the Hanging Gardens, tradition says, refurbished what, what had been the Tower of Babel, built his own palace, be made it a beautiful um, city. We should talk more about the Hanging Gardens later. If we have okay. time. Okay. You probably know more about them than I do, actually. So he's there just, just thinking about all of this and apparently falls asleep. I saw a dream which made me afraid. You know, this this is not the kind of thing that world conquerors normally do. I, I, I don't know. Admit you, they got scared. Okay, admit they got scared, yeah, from a dream. Yeah. Um, even even in things like you know the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis, it had to be long over before anybody came out and said, "Boy, that was terrifying." We almost blew up the world. Uh, it's you, you you don't play that card until you have to. But he's admitting it freely, so he's already kind of breaking the mold here. And the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I made a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. This should sound familiar. <laughs> and they're done this. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, various brands of magic practitioners. And this time he doesn't insist that they tell him the dream first. He just blurts it out. He says, I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Okay. Kind of like last time. But last time, he met Daniel. And this time, he doesn't go to Daniel right away, which is interesting. He, you would think he'd remember how this played out last time and just say, <laughs> you know, cut out the middleman, call Daniel in. But he doesn't. But it, at last, finally, Daniel comes in. At last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. That is the God he'd worshipped so far, most of us, or all of his life until now according to the name of my God, and whom is the spirit of the holy gods? 
Okay, gods. That's Elohim, so it could mean plural pagan gods, or it can mean the creator, and that seems to be the intent here. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, or the magi, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods, or of the holy God, is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of my head in my bed. This time he remembers it quite vividly and does not hesitate to tell what he saw. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. And the tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof unto the end of all the earth. Meaning as far as you went, some people have used this to argue for a flat earth, but we move on. <laughs> the leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was food for all, and the beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heavens dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. Now, various religions and mythologies have their tree of life, or their cosmic axis, or their Yggdrasil, some kind of the world ash tree, some kind of great cosmic thing the world spins around that often looks like a tree. So the first thought would be, well, whatever this is, it's really, really important. It's important not simply in some kind of magical cosmic sense, but it's socially important because the beast and the, and the fowls and everything rest in it, lodges in it, finds shadow in it, and um, all flesh is fed of it. So it's it's this is more than just your ordinary garden apple tree. This is something big and special and really tall, and it casts its shadow to the ends of the earth, apparently. And I saw in the vision of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one. That's a watcher, even a holy one. So, so there this are, is an angel? Apparently, some yes, some kind of angelic presence. It's probably not the watcher out of the Marvel Universe who stands on the moon and watches Earth and records. This is something, <laughs> someone who works for God, a holy one. He came down from heaven. And he cried aloud and said thus, hew down the tree and cut off its branches, shake off its leaves, scatter its fruit. Let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his root in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a, a beast's heart be given to him till seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, and a man by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth it up, and setteth up over it the basest of men. This dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen, now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation there, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the Spirit of the Holy God is in thee. So why didn't he call Daniel? Probably because he had a pretty sneaking idea of where this was going. <laughs> there are some sorts of news we don't want. There are reasons we don't phone back our doctor, you know. Let, or we let don't. me <laughs> clarify a question here. Yeah. Like the angel said all of these things in the dream. Yeah. That's not even the interpretation. That's just the dream. That's just the dream. <laughs> it's so, pretty clear already. <laughs> yeah. Did he really need Daniel to? No, he didn't <laughs> really need Daniel. I mean, it doesn't come out. He was right looking out. for someone to tell him it meant something else. Yeah, pretty much. He was hoping for some. Uh, the, the amazing thing is that all the other wise men couldn't even get that far. Mm -hmm. Whether they whether it was because they really couldn't make sense of it or because they had a sneak and suspicion where it went, went and they didn't want to be the ones to say it is another matter. Yeah, the only question is, so this tree is what? I mean, there was this, let his heart be changed from a man's and let a beast's heart be given. That's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. This thing is a human being with a man's heart, and he's going to lose the man's heart and get that of a beast. Oh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, buddy, who do you think this is? <laughs> who's having the dream? Yeah, <laughs> who's having the dream? Oh, Nebuchadnezzar's having it. Right, Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar's having it. So what are we supposed to make of this? Well, first of all, Nebuchadnezzar's having this dream. He is a pagan king, and although he has been influenced on two occasions, maybe three, 
by Daniel and his friends and has acknowledged that their God is kind of special and unusual and can work miracles. Um, and and he's, he likes Daniel and his friends apparently, although that wasn't clear as of the last chapter when he threw three of them into the fiery furnace, <laughs> you know, but apparently they got along afterward. So the amazing thing is that God is revealing himself to a Gentile, an unbeliever even, not just a Gentile, but a Gentile unbeliever, uh, who arguably has kind of played the role of Antichrist. I mean, he's looted and sacked Jerusalem, taken away their king, set up another king, has laid siege to it, and at some point in here, I don't know what year this is in his reign, if he hasn't already, he's going to destroy the city and the temple and carry the rest of the people captive. And it is to such a person that God comes with a dream. Now, truly, it is a terrible dream, a frightening dream. And yet, like all of God's messages, if God is still talking to you, there's hope. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and some people have trouble with that. Well, God wouldn't just come and say, judgment, destruction, doom, gloom, Sodom and Gomorrah. That's yeah, what he Jonah said. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, Jonah's a good, good case in point. Yeah, that's exactly what Jonah said. But as long as God is still talking, even if he doesn't say, repent, you might as well try it, because what have you got to lose <laughs> right now? And there are times where God has accepted such repentance. He's turned from his wrath. So if God is talking to you, I mean, another example I was thinking of was uh, Saul, when he consults mm. with the evil, well, tries to consult with the evil spirit, and Samuel shows yeah. up. And people have argued, well, that can't really be Samuel, because he would plead with him to repent. No, he wouldn't. We've been there and done that, but the he fact, spent his whole life doing that. Yeah, it's that, that got no. <laughs> he's not going to do it after he's dead. <laughs> but he does talk to him and tell him, "You have twenty four hours." Mm -hmm. uh, he's already laid down everything Saul needs to do. Saul knows the gospel. Saul knows the need for repentance. Samuel, in one last miracle, by God's grace, is allowed to point out judgment is right ahead. The train tracks are broken at the bridge. You're about to go into the pit. Anything come to mind here? <laughs> Apparently not. So here is God revealing what could be a very terrible judgment. We're told that what's going to happen, seven times will pass over him. I think writers have generally assumed seven years. It doesn't say years. It may be years. Seasons, months, probably more than days. Long enough to make some kind of huge effect upon himself and upon the community in which he lived, his advisors and lords and such. It, it, it again is going to be a significant judgment. And as Daniel hears this, he is astonished. Now, before we go on, going going back to the point I was almost trying to make and should have. Why is God talking to a Gentile king? Well, at the moment, this Gentile king happens to be the caretaker of God's people. For better or worse, whether they like it or not, whether the man is a God-fearer or not, here is the man who is the king of the covenant people, the one who rules over them, and he has been put there by God. In fact, not simply, we don't simply see it, well, it happened, so therefore God intended it. In Jeremiah, God says, I've given all these kingdoms to Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. Submit. And if you don't, I will judge you. And he says this specifically to Judah. And when Zedekiah tries to, the, the king of Judah tries to get out of that, Jeremiah says, No, surrender. Go out to him. You'll live. The city will not fall. But I'm afraid and stuff will happen. No, just go do it. No, but thank you. Go back to your prison cell. Uh, and because of this role that God has given him, and that he will give other pagan kings, we think here of Cyrus and Darius and some of these others, uh, they are, in effect, Messiah figures, and thus the tree, tree of life. But you can think of, um, there's a couple sections of scripture, which I will now find. One we know well enough from Matthew 13. Mm -hmm. This is the... Uh, this, the agricultural parables, and Jesus is talking about seeds and trees and such. And in verse 31, he says this, 
The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. When it's grown, it's the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now, here he's emphasizing growing from something small to growing to something big, but this image of a tree in which the birds come and lodge is common to both, uh, and it's not a bad thing. I've, I've actually heard Bible teachers say, well, in Scripture, birds are bad, evil things because they're unclean. So this just means <laughs> the kingdom of God is going to descend into degradation and, and wickedness and evil powers and demons will come and nest in it. Okay, um, that's real. I mean, that leaven is, yeah, <laughs> leaven is always evil is bad enough, but um, uh, yeah. this is really distorting the parable. But mm -hmm. the other uh, passage is in Ezekiel, who was writing about the same time that Daniel was ministering. And this is Ezekiel 17 and verse 22. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also take of the highest branch of the high cedar, and I will set it. I will crop off the top of his young twigs, a tender one, and will plant it upon a high mountain and imminent. In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it, and it shall bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a goodly cedar, and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing, and in the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell, and all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree, and have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken, and have done it. And that seems to be a picture of, again, Messiah's kingdom. So there's some similarity. Um, it's easy to think that only good, whole, pure, pure men are fit types of Christ. But the very office itself can point to Christ. He's the king of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, our evangelical friends may have trouble with that. Well, the king of the world, we know who that is. That's Antichrist. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the funny thing about typology, right? Is that you can, it's so often two sides of the same coin yeah. mm -hmm. where the Antichrist is not on a purely syntactical level. The anti doesn't mean necessarily that he's standing in opposition to Christ, although that's what it means in English. But in right. the Greek, the sense is much more, he's standing in the place of Christ. And right. that can be a distortion and very much against Christ. Right. Or it can be, he's standing in this place representing Christ in a distorted way. And that's something of what we have here. Nebuchadnezzar is supposed to be a Christ figure, mm -hmm. but he's not because of his personal character. Now, we might think, well, there's his public policy. He's a, a tyrant. He wages war. He's a conqueror, warmonger. He's warred against God's people. And yet, when Daniel comes to analyze this, he doesn't point to any of that. He points to his ongoing work as a magistrate. And the problem with the way he conducts it is not, he's not in touch with the best policies and the right procedures. He needs to restructure his cabinet. He needs to reorganize the flow of power. He needs none of, none of that. Um, let's look and see what Daniel says to all this. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. And the king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation, the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. See, Daniel has come to be fond of Nebuchadnezzar and to wish him well, despite the fact he's still a pagan. The tree that thou sawest, which, and he's going to repeat the dream largely, which grew and was strong and whose height reached to heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much, and it was food for all, and under the under the beast of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king. Thou art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the ends of the earth. Uh, how messianic is that? Hmm. 
The question is, are you going to... God has put you here in this role. And then that's a major theme here. This is not an accident of history. You didn't get this because you were so smart and clever and powerful and such a great warrior. God has put you here, knowing full well that you're an unbeliever, that you worship false gods. Uh, God God has co-opted your reign in favor of his own kingdom. What are you going to do about that? Because right now, God is threatening judgment. You're not doing it right. Whereas the king saw a watcher and even a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, hew the tree down and destroy it and let leave the stump of the root thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beast of the field till seven times pass over. This is the interpretation, okay. Like, do we need one? I think you just kind of implied it. <laughs> Uh, this is the decree of the Most High. Yes, it's announced by angels, but they're not the originators. There is a God in heaven who stands behind all of this, the God who you say you appreciate. Well, you better start appreciating a whole lot more. Um, this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that they shall drive thee from men. My dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. And they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. You have to acknowledge the sovereignty of God. You have to acknowledge his providential rule over creation. You know that the American Constitution says we can never ask a presidential candidate or office holder that question. Do you believe in the sovereignty of God? Do you believe in his providential role? We are forbidden to give any kind of religious test whatever to our public officials. God did not hesitate to have a <laughs> litmus test for Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel says, uh, this is the God. It's not enough for you to acknowledge that there's this great God out there someplace who does nifty stuff for his servants down there. That's insufficient. You're going to have to acknowledge publicly, officially, this doctrine we call the sovereignty of God. You're going to have to become an operating Calvinist on, and, and you announce it on paper. <laughs> you can't do that. This is a pagan kingdom. The rest of the people don't believe in that. How can you put yourself forward as a representative of a people when you're going to say that you don't share their religion? God put me here? <laughs> well, you're just, no. God put me here. He it's just also told worth me. noting that God put him there before he made this confession. <laughs> before he made this concession. God did not wait until he was converted. God put him in place mm -hmm. to use him. And um, since he hasn't gotten the clue, God is now intervening in his life in a very personal, pri private, and public way mm -hmm. to get his attention. God not only rules over the kingdoms of the world, but he gives them to whomsoever he will. If a kingdom has a king, God put that king there. And, and we struggle with that sometimes as Christians, and particularly as American conservatives. Well, there's no way God gave us our current president. Sorry. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> but but he's, he's not a good man. And, you, you know, everything follows all the critiques. Like, well, yeah, that kind of means that God thought that's what we deserved, apparently. That he, in fact, is a proper representative of the American people. Uh, does God have other plans beyond that? I don't know. Have you been playing, praying for our president lately? Daniel was concerned about his king, even though he was a pagan. Whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. God's going to do you a great favor. He's going to hold your kingdom intact until you come back. We don't know who received the power, who was the steward. It might have been Daniel himself, might not have been. But God used some means to make sure the kingdom didn't fall apart. Probably part of it was Daniel's assurance that he's going to be sane again, and you better have done the right thing when he is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Wherefore, now, now here's what Daniel tells him he needs to do. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Again, not your public policies, your philosophical determinations, your worldview. You have specific sins, 
and you need to repent. You need to stop committing them. And particularly, he highlights showing mercy to the poor. You got a lot of wealth. There are poor people in your kingdom, in your city. What have you done for them lately? Now, is this a welfare system? No, the king actually owned everything. <laughs> in the American system, the federal government really isn't supposed to be owning everything. In fact, it probably wasn't supposed to own everything it does own now. Uh, military bases and a plot of land for Washington, D.C. was about as far as the founding fathers envisioned. And military bases was yeah. questionable. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> Embassies, maybe. Yeah. But you know, it was very limited in what they were to own. But the king actually did own everything. Basically, the king got rich and then he used his own private money to do whatever he wanted, whether it was communicate money to other lords or to programs or to people or to whatever he needed. And so Daniel says, basically, you are filthy rich. You got that way by conquering nations. Okay, whatever. You have, But the fact is you have the money. There are poor people who need it. So this is, this is personal charity. Yes, after a form, it is governmental charity. But Only because the king is the Because the king is the government. Personified. <laughs> yeah. And so this is not primarily a public or official reprimand or instruction. This is a personal one. You have personal sins, and you need to repent of them personally. Uh, does, does the character of a ruler matter to God? Obviously. Mm -hmm. And what needs to happen is not a change of public policy, although that may follow and often will and should. But first of all, how are you treating your wife? How are you treating your employees, your secretary? Are you trying to seduce her? How are you, are you padding your expense account? Are you kicking your dog? Are you dumping trash in your neighbor's? You know, what are you doing in your practical everyday affairs? You're slandering people? You're lying about them? What are you doing that is drawing God's wrath down upon you? Let's start with your private life. Let's start with your personal character. You know, there, there was a time when personal character was an issue for American presidents. You know, there was always the, the pushback on religious areas, but in terms of Personal character. Well, yeah, no, there was always the the two party system, everyone attacking everybody's personal <laughs> character. So that you know that was a given. But as late as Grover Cleveland, we have this. Wait, didn't you have an illegitimate child? Yeah, but I'm a better president than the other guy. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> then we get to John F. Kennedy. It's like lots of stuff going on here, but the media really likes the guy, so they're not going to tell us anything. And then we get to Bill Clinton, who is caught as it were, red-handed, pants down, uh, and suddenly the liberals are, but, but, but personal character doesn't really matter. The question is, is he a good president? God has a different opinion of this. God looks at the man. Yes, the, he distinguishes the man in the office, and yet, if the man is wicked, it is eventually going to contaminate the office. And if the man is wicked, whether he's in office or not, God still will have words with him. It's a question of how public they're going to be and how much the rest of the kingdom is going to be affected by it. And this is a huge problem with the Romans, mm. um, the Roman philosophers, if you can call them philosophers. I think they, <laughs> didn't, they didn't really go in for that, being Romans. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Marcus Aurelius, is sort of classical authors, is that there is this distinction between public morality mm. and private mm. morality. That is really unsustainable. But, and the Bible yeah. certainly doesn't recognize any such division. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it actually does matter, and our founding fathers, in saying that we may not ask any religious question, betrayed the nation, or what was becoming a nation at that point. All of the, all of the colonies and then the states had religious tests on their books. They were often very simple. Do you believe in the God of the Bible? Do you accept the Protestant Christian religion? Do you at least believe the Bible is the word of God? And there is a last judgment. That shows up a lot because their assumption was, if you don't know, believe you're going to have to answer one day for all this, why should we trust you? What What is going to compel you to act in a civically righteous manner if you don't believe there's a God you're going to have to answer to? Mm -hmm. And with others, it was even it was even clearer that the, this... The, we're not going to ask you what kind, of, what flavor of Christian you are, but you better be some kind of Christian if you're going to hold office in the state. But when we get to the federal constitution, that was wiped away, presumably to keep those denominations and sects happy who were afraid of a, of a state church. Mm -hmm. 
But there were ways that could have been phrased. Mm-hmm. It may not have been easy, but you could do something like, do you confess the doctrines confessed at Nicaea? Uh, do you believe in the creator God of Scripture, who is Father, Son, and Spirit? Do you believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world? There are some very simple things that could have been asked. And that, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Um, that would have eliminated a lot. How about a simple moral question? Have you cheated on your wife lately? <laughs> Given the Bible's standard for church leaders, you would think that civil leaders should have to answer similar questions. So how many prostitutes have you visited this week? Uh, why, why don't we ask those questions? Well, because we don't want to talk about their sins, because then we might have to talk about ours. Mm-hmm. And it, that's, let's just not talk about morality. Let's make it an ethically neutral field where if you're a good administrator, that's all that really matters. Well, that's not what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel said that if you repent, maybe God will will postpone the judgment and lengthen your time of peace. And apparently, to some extent, that happened. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked on the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Again, his building projects. Not his prowess as a warrior or his genius as a tactician and strategist, but he was a great builder and he did what we have of that's left over, which is not a lot, gives us some hint that it was enormous, and it was beautiful. The Herodotus describes Babylon, and his description is breathtaking. It was a huge, beautiful city encompassing fields and pastures with a river running through it and walls that chariots could pass each other on. Um, and so, you know, you think, well, this is just this is just manly pride, but God sees it differently. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to the it is notice that God calls him King Nebuchadnezzar mm. because that is part of this. We would say, You old scumbag, probably, but God doesn't. God treats him with the respect that God himself has endued him with. He is a king, he's just a wicked one. No King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from among men, and the, thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. We keep coming back to that theme of God's sovereignty. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. Now, a while back, I noted that oxen and eagles, um, these are uh, cherubic animals. Mm-hmm. And But I, I thought, well, then where's the lion and the man? And my wife said, well, <laughs> the lion? has just been humbled to be an ox, as has the man. The Babylon in uh, Daniel 7 is portrayed as a lot winged lion. Mm-hmm. And even there, the emphasis is, yeah, and he gets his wings plucked. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's hints here of, Nebuchadnezzar, you were a cherubic guardian of Israel. God honored you by letting you guard and take care of his people, and you screwed it up. So you get to go out in the field and eat grass like an ox. How the stomach processes this, I don't know but it got arranged for it. Technically, this is called boanthropy. <laughs> like lycanthropy, but lyca is wolf <laughs> and bo is bovine is cow or whatever that's worth. And he's out there for however long seven times is. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes into heaven and mine understanding returned unto me and I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion... So this is not a God who evolves out of chaos. This is an eternal God. Whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. 
Okay, sovereignty of God. His kingdom is from generation to generation. He rules in the affairs of men. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. God's will versus human will, God wins. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? It's kind of like Rahab's confession, quick and to the point, and it stresses the sovereignty of God, his complete control of history. Uh, At the same time, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned to me. And my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now, that's all past. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven, all whose works are truth. Talk about that for a long time. Mm -hmm. In all his ways, judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to obey. I'm, I'm sure there are people who are unsatisfied because there's no mention of his embracing the promise of Messiah or pointing to Israel or even to Scripture, and yet his profession is more than we require of most people who come forward for church membership or baptism or even just to mm-hmm. receive Christ at the altar. It's a profound recognition of the greatness of God and mm-hmm. of God's not just abstract greatness out there, his transcendence, but his eminence, his power, and his reign right here. This is not a chance that happened to me. God did this to me. God humbled me. God took away my mind. God made me live like a, a beast, and then he graciously gave me back my kingdom. And my response is not resentment, a chagrin. It is thanksgiving that he has humbled me and put me in a place where I could do good. And the first thing I want to do is tell the world about this God. It's a pretty good confession. Uh, And it comes at a key moment in redemptive history when we are turning the corner toward the restoration and toward the the scattering of Israel throughout the world and the preparation for Messiah. And God lets a Gentile king uh, not only shepherd his people, but but converts him, brings him to faith, and lets him write Scripture. And you can imagine, remember that the Hebrews had a, had a king, depending where we are in the timeline. He's either cowering in Jerusalem or he's in a prison cell in Babylon. Mm-hmm. This is the king with whom God works. And this is not the way it's supposed to happen because God only works with <laughs> nice Jewish people. Israel needed to reevaluate her perceptions of history and politics mm-hmm. and of the way God does things. Mm-hmm. And if, of who God can save and use. with God. Yeah. You know, there's so much we could dig into here. Like the, uh, I don't think we have time to go into the the gardens. I, I w- wanted to talk about them not because I know much about them as gardens, but just the typology of the garden well, within yeah. the city. Um, the garden in the city. It, yeah. Babylon is a counterfeit to Jerusalem. Most certainly, mm-hmm. it is. It was four square. It's a la- it's a city of rivers, and in the center is this ziggurat. Mm-hmm. Um, that has, depending on whether these were two separate things or the same thing, and I've seen interpretations that run both ways, that the ziggurat itself was a garden. Was that the hanging gardens or the hanging gardens? Something, something. Whatever the case, uh, the heart of the city, up high, like a mountain, mm-hmm. is occupied with gardens that are somehow mm-hmm. mechanically watered because it takes some effort to pump yeah. water up there. And this is the most beautiful city in the world, the best yeah. city in the world. Yes. It's it's not one that's urbanized and turned to concrete. It's one no. that has life <laughs> in the middle. Yeah. But it's not and, the life of Christ. But they are offered a chance here. Mm-hmm. And we must assume because destruction comes that most people reject it. We don't see a whole lot of hope here. In the next story, we do see the queen mother um, who comes forward and tells Belshazzar, there's this guy named Daniel. She may have been a god fearer. She may have been a believer. She may have realized he's the only one who could save this out of this mess. You better talk to him, (laughs) you little brat. But he can't say that to the king. So she has to be, you know, kiss up and all. So there probably were some people here and there who did profit, who may have come to Christ through this testimony. And who knows, in the hinterlands, the outlying lands, this this decree went throughout all the world. And no doubt it got people's attention. Now, what God did with that, 
we have no way of knowing. But since it's it is scripture, and yet it was published throughout his empire, we have a Gentile. Again, this would be like uh, the American State Department at the behest of the president taking a co- taking a verse of uh, a passage of scripture and sending it by federal mail to every <laughs> citizen in the country, saying, "This is what your president believes. Take it seriously." And again, most people would say would scream separation of church and state, and those screaming the loudest might just be church people, mm-hmm. particularly people affected by something called two-kingdom theology, in fact. But Nebuchadnezzar does not see two kingdoms. He sees one kingdom. He works for the king, and his job is to forward the progress of that kingdom in time and history. And the God's kingdom is moving to becoming Messiah's kingdom, as he already knew from his previous vision. The kingdom the God of heaven will set up in the last days is the kingdom of Messiah. And all that God is doing through Nebuchadnezzar, no, it's not about you, Nebuchadnezzar, so you can be glorified. You're a tool. You're an instrument. Go with that and be helpful or resist that and be broken. Mm -hmm. And God let him do a little both. And in the end, he comes out and says, no, this king is truth. This kingdom, this king is mercy. This king is judgment. Fear him. And only eternity will tell us how many people listen to it. Yeah. This just is one final nugget. Maybe mm-hmm. you have something to say about this idea, but the conversion into something that eats vegetables rather than meat, <laughs> might that be a hearkening back to the covenant with Noah, where God gave the animals to man for food? sort of a withdrawing of that even. Now that's an interesting thought. I thought you were going to do something simpler like, you know, is vegetarianism a good thing? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a far more covenantal discussion. Uh, that makes sense to me. I haven't thought about it before because I've never heard anyone say that, but that's an interesting thought. Yes, he becomes beast-like, so in that sense, subhuman but you're right, since the flood, humans, all of humanity, have fallen into the Noah covenant. And it's not a common grace covenant, it's a redemptive covenant. But it, ref- it embraces everybody. In that sense, it's common grace in that the special grace overflows, and everybody is bound by it. And, and, but when God gave it, the only people on earth were believers, God-fearers, mm-hmm. Noah and his family. So it was given to the church. And but that and I'd yes. love to talk more about that because I've been mulling over that a lot lately. But <laughs> I'm I'm trying to stay focused here. So. <laughs> well, that but you're right. That marked mankind. Mankind is given dominion over the animals, and so that should immediately take us back to Noah and to Genesis, and to Adam, and here because before Noah, all of the the herbs of the field were given for food, but not yeah. the animals. But with Noah, it changes, yeah. So we, yeah, I think you may be right. We're going all the way back again, back to, you've lost the privileges that you got. The Noahic covenant was an advance over the covenant at the Garden Gate. God gave man more privileges and more responsibilities. The privilege of executing murderers. That He put the sword in the hand of the state, officially. That's a huge thing. And now Nebuchadnezzar has lost that, both figuratively, in that he can't eat meat, he can only eat grass, and literally, in that oxen don't hold swords in their hands. Mm -hmm. So he's he's lost, and he personally doesn't hold a sword. He can't rule, he can't hold a scepter, he can't hold a sword. Yeah, we've we've, we've gone backward, we've devolved. This is Mm -hmm. anti-evolution, both covenantally and biologically. You know, there's there's a good deal of judgment here. This this is spectacular. And remember up front, he called it, how wonderful are his signs. Yeah, this is pretty wonderful. This is, this is amazing. And the world should have stood back and said, whoa. But as with so many, so many things, the world doesn't always say, whoa, when it should. Well, that is all the time we have. I feel like we could talk for so long about Nebuchadnezzar. It's just fascinating stuff. Um, but we should do some recommendations, and I have one. What is already. your recommendation? Um, my recommendation is a board game. If you are into board games, uh, David gave me this one for Christmas, and we've played it at least once a week ever since. Um, it's called Wingspan, and the premise is you have a bird sanctuary, and you're trying to build the best bird sanctuary. 
and it has a bunch of different birds in it that are all beautifully drawn and there's like information from the Audubon Society on each of them. So as you're playing this game, you're getting <laughs> to know different birds, which is very fun. Um, I've already identified a few that I see at the park down the street from me <laughs> that I didn't know before because we've been playing this game. Um, but it's a lot of fun. It's a, a good balance for us because David is competitive and I am not. Um, mm. And I have a shorter attention span for these sort of things. So it takes about 45 minutes to play. And it's, again, very beautiful. Um, and it's one of these where you kind of have to think ahead, but it's not a, a, a burdensome amount of thinking ahead. Um, so <laughs> I'm not very good at thinking very far ahead. So David and I are pretty evenly matched. It's very, a, a balanced game. <laughs> <laughs> so what thinking and aggression are, um, cancel each other out or something? Is that what I hear you saying? They're different strengths. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Sounds good. Uh, I could not think of anything, so I turned to my beloved wife and said, what do you recommend? And she said, people should read the book of Judges. And I said, okay, I'll do that. She said, no, that's my recommendation. You have to come up with one. So <laughs> I'm going to say, you should read the book of Judges to your children. Oh, that's not, yes. That's not what she said. That's but it's different. full of sex and violence, Greg. Yeah, that's why you should read it to your kids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really, um, she just got through teaching the Book of Judges to her sixth grade class. And there were numerous stories, particularly the two big stories at the end, that mm -hmm. her kids, no surprise here, had never heard of and said, as so many people do when they hear about them, that can't be in the Bible. Okay, why are we not, why, not only we're not reading it to our kids, we're not reading it. Pastors aren't teaching and preaching through it. The other thing that goes with this, though, is, and Kate did say, well, this is where you meet real, real people. And she's right. These are very real people, full of flaws, uh, spiritual and otherwise. And it's easy to say, well, these are just really poor these are people who tried to to walk the path of righteousness and just utterly failed, and they're mostly there to show us how we can shipwreck. That's not why they're there. <laughs> uh, they're listed, a number of them are listed in the Heroes of Faith, in Hebrews 11. They are examples of godliness, but godly people should be perfect. Uh -huh. mm, I think and we have that an would issue include, there. yeah, that would include you. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm better than them. Really? Hmm. Are you now? Let, can we talk about certain things in your private life? Well, no, that's personal. Yeah, their their personal things got splattered on the pages of scripture for our learning. So you can look at these guys and you can see, yeah, there are places where they failed. But here but here's the thing that goes with that. Because there are real failures there, we get in the habit of saying that anything we don't understand or that we wouldn't do must be a failure. <laughs> and sometimes we exaggerate it to the point of we make up stuff. Um, it does not take a very close reading of Judges or of Hebrews 11 to say that Jephthah obviously did not burn his daughter in the fire. Read the text carefully. What is it actually saying? And yet it's amazing how people, how many people not only believe that that's what he did, but will write commentaries defending that and mm -hmm. be willing to argue with you about it. Like, no, that's what it says. That is not what it says. And it doesn't take, again, it doesn't take a great deal of reading, but you have to slow down and get rid of your preconceptions that all these people are failures and wicked and you are so much better than they are. And you've got to stop and realize, wait, these are ordinary believers just like me. And once you come to terms with that, that's actually a great encouragement. Mm -hmm. You mean, I don't have to be a super saint for God to use me? When I was a kid, there was a saying, God cannot use an unclean or will not use an unclean vessel. God's got nothing but unclean vessels to work with, unless you include justification by faith, in which case all of his people are holy, and he's not seen iniquity in Israel. So Judges, I think, robs us of some of our moralism and perfectionism and makes us, pietism, makes us think like real people in the real world. And once you get there, it's a marvelously entertaining book. It is full of action and surprises and weirdness. And all the stuff that goes into good novels and good adventure stories, but and and thus is a great book to read to your kids. Kids will eat it up. Mm -hmm. It's adults who draw back and say, "Ooh, that's gross. I'm afraid it will upset my child." 
But God gave it to his covenant people, and to willfully withhold it from our children is a sin against our children. And in reading it to them and, let, and trying to answer their questions, we may learn more about God and his covenant, his ways with men, and ourselves than we knew before. So, read the book of Judges, teach it, read it to your children, let them enjoy it, and when you don't get something, read closer hmm. and try to figure out what's going on. If God says this is a spirit-filled man who was full of faith, you better figure out how that works, and hmm. it will teach you something about yourself. There's a wonderful humor in the book of Judges, too, which oh, is it, another it is shock to the uh, Victorian Christian sensibilities. <laughs> Yeah. Of, wait, God thinks this is funny, but it's horrible. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe there's <laughs> such a thing as godly black humor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, he put the sword in this guy's belly and the excrement came out. And that's, my kids are laughing at it. I This isn't, this isn't, God's telling dirty stories. Okay, come on, get over it. <laughs> it should be your first hint that your sense of morality is wrong, not God's. Mm -hmm. And that may cause you to reevaluate a lot of things. So. Read the book of Judges, read it to your kids. Enjoy it. Laugh at it. With it. <laughs> Laugh with it. Yes. yes. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. I wish we had more time for this one especially. But we look forward to next week. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Oh, a little bit of housekeeping. We are coming up on a little bit of a hiatus, recording-wise. It's, it's a combination of lots of factors. Brian has a lot going on. Uh, David and I have a lot going on. We're going to get Gretchen out to visit her great-grandparents, uh, Lord willing. So we're going to have to take a little break from recording, but we will endeavor to not leave you with nothing, but rather leave you with something. And so <laughs> <laughs> we will be releasing episodes every other week instead of weekly. Um, I believe starting with this coming week. So just so you're aware. We, we're still here for you. We just might not be here for you as often. <laughs> but you can still email us anytime, day or night, at haltingtowardszion <laughs> at gmail.com. We just won't pick it up at night. Right. We won't pick up the email. <laughs> you can follow us on Goodreads or follow me on Goodreads. I think Brian is also on Goodreads. Are you on Goodreads yet, Greg? I don't know about this Goodreads thing. I'll tell me about it later. Yeah. It's, it's great. Yeah. Oh, if you would like to support us financially... Uh, you can do so by visiting our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or our Patreon, patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. Big thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling, buying us better microphones and editing equipment. It really does make the world of difference. Subscribe to our Substack if you want transcripts. We have wonderful transcripts. And uh, tell a friend about us. If you enjoy this show, you probably have a friend who will also enjoy this show. So thank you so much for listening. We will see you next week. Uh -huh. Or the week after. Or sometime.